apologise in advance because um, my presentation is fairly image heavy and I have a sneaky suspicion that, uh, like some of the rest of you, they might not all be visible. So I'll apologise now rather than doing it for each individual slide. Now, what I wanted to do for this conference, this being the New Forest Knowledge Conference, is briefly discuss what knowledge is. And fortunately, with the powers of the internet, we can find out that Merriam-Webster define it as the sum of what is known, or the body of truth, information and principles acquired by humankind. Now, what's interesting though about knowledge is it's all very relative. And I often think of knowledge as being a bit of a pyramid. There is simplistic knowledge to the top, and then there is more detailed and wider knowledge at the bottom. If we were to equate this to maths, for instance, uh, basic maths is 2 plus 2, um, and then more complicated knowledge, more detailed knowledge, would be that stuff, algebra, that I completely failed to learn at school. What's interesting about this model is it's very often directly proportional to the uh, amount of people who know, or indeed even care, about this level of knowledge. And you can relate that in a completely opposite triangle. Now, most people in the wider world, the public, are able to do the most basic bit of information or a bit of knowledge. Everyone knows that 2 plus 2 equals 5 or 6. Um, whereas more professional people, experts, tend to be the ones who know the wider knowledge, who have more information uh, and can obtain that information, but they are in the minority. So knowledge tends to be a relative thing. Uh, and that is particularly true, I think, when we come to look at the Second World War history of Leap Country Park, which is just down in the southeast corner on the coast of the New Forest National Park. Now, Leap uh, and its Second World War history being still within living memory, there has always been a fairly broad amount of knowledge about what happened there during the war. Most people know that there was, at some point, a Second World War gun battery down in the area of the current car park. Further east, oh, sorry, uh, a gun battery in the area of the car park. Further east, um, up on the coast in Stanswood Bay, there was an area of construction for Mulberry Harbour, that incredible invention that was towed over to Normandy beaches to create a harbour on normal beaches after the invasion. Uh, a little bit south of that, there is an embarkation hard that was used for loading troops, men and equipment and materiel onto landing craft prior to their journey over to the beaches. And somewhere within the National Park area, somewhere within the confines of Leap, it is known that there was that incredible invention, Pluto, pipeline under the ocean, a cable for transporting fuel that was laid across the seabed using the conundrum, this giant cotton wheel that was used to unlay it from the Isle of Wight to Cherbourg. And that is really, for a long time, the extent of our knowledge about Leap. Um, most of that is incorporated, if you like, in the remains that are still visible on the beaches today. When that started to change, comes back, uh, as recent, uh, sorry, as far back as 1990. Um, in that year, there was a great storm that uh, caused a lot of damage across the country and also caused massive undermining of parts of the Mulberry Harbour section uh, on the beach. That undermining, that coastal erosion that is indeed still visible today. A survey was undertaken in July of that year uh, to assess, if you like, the extent of the remains and the extent of the damage that had been caused by it. That survey was actually undertaken by, before she was famous, Carenza Lewis and Michael Hughes. Uh, Carenza was working for the Royal Commission for Historical Monuments at the time. Michael Hughes, I believe, was Hampshire County Council. Uh, and this is probably the first detailed archaeological survey of the Mulberry Harbour construction site and the embarkation hard that we have on record. And they investigated the extent features, recording them in great detail, and we can see over at the far end the extent of the damage caused by the storm earlier that year. And indeed, after this survey had been completed, Hampshire County Council undertook the demolition of that area using the rubble to establish a more uh, rigorous, if we like, coastal defence along that bit of beach. Shortly after that, between 1994 and 2002, I believe. Um, Historic England, as it is now English Heritage at the time, commissioned the Council for British Archaeology to undertake a series of in-depth reports using uh, detailed records of Second World War infrastructure available in the National Archives. And a gentleman called Colin Dobson, who worked at the National Archives, established a massive sum of 
material from those archives that were available that he had good access to and was incredibly knowledgeable on. Uh, Twelve separate series incorporating numerous volumes for each series called the 20th Century Fortifications of England. This is a massive undertaking, an incredibly useful uh, source of data for future research. It also established a few things that put, uh, for a start, the, uh, the coastal battery at Leap into the um, National Historic Environment Authority. It was at the time the National Monument Record, now the National Record for the Historical Environment, and first put a dot on the map for that. But unfortunately, those sorts of details, including his particular report on Embarkation Hards, Volume 5, um, never really made it into the public domain. They remained unpublished. And so, although he established some early detailed knowledge, that information did not go any further into the wider public. It didn't really help enhance our understanding of the information, uh, sorry, our understanding of what was happening at LEAP, because most people never saw it. And in fact, those reports are as rare as hen's teeth. You probably lay odds that I may be the only person in this room who's ever even seen one, possibly. Um, but they are very useful reports if you can get hold of them. Shortly after that, there was another very large project, the Defence of Britain project, carried out by the Council of British Archaeology. This was a, a largely crowdfunded, uh, sorry, crowdsourced data, if you like, where members of the public recorded <laughs> sites of Second World War interest around their local area, uh, which uncovered a huge amount of... Um, previously unrecorded World War II infrastructure. It's unfortunate then that none of it was recorded around Leap. And in fact, the nearest record is that pillbox up on the coast closer to Calshot. And so we come roughly to the end of the 20th century, being not really a huge, much, a huge amount more knowledgeable, if you like, about the state of things at Leap Country Park than we were before. We knew that there were embarkation hards, mulberry, a gun battery, and somewhere within that entire site, Pluto Harbour. Now a couple of things, sorry, Pluto Pipeline. A couple of things have changed since those initial surveys were undertaken. Uh, as we've gone through up until uh, the present day, in fact, we've gone through the 60th and 70th anniversaries of the Second World War, and technology has improved massively since the early clunky days of your average PC. One of these has provided the impetus to do more research on sites like this. The other has given us the ability to do so in a much more efficient manner. Unfortunately, literature has not really expanded to cover more information about what we would like to know about these sites. When Carenza Lewis wrote her report in 1990 on the Mulberry Harbour construction site, she fell back on Airfix magazine as a reference, this particular issue from 1986, because it covered Mulberry Harbour. I'm surprised that she didn't use Codename Mulberry by Guy Hartcut, published in 1977, which does have a bit more detail than Airfix magazine. That said, not a huge amount on what was happening at Leap by virtue of the fact it was covering the entire uh, assemblage of Mulberry Harbour, and therefore Leap is dealt with in less than a page. So there's not a huge amount of extra information to be drawn from it. And the situation hasn't really changed today. Codename Mulberry still remains the most popular, perhaps definitive publication on Mulberry Harbour. There are others, but they're much harder to get hold of. However, in the last 10 years, there have been a number of projects that have given us the opportunity to enhance our understanding, our knowledge of what was happening at Leap. Most recently, um, Citizen Project, an archaeological project looking at archaeology exposed as a result of coastal change. Prior to that, Solent 70, which was run by myself, uh, when I worked for Maritime Archaeology Trust with the funding and support of Hampshire County Council and New Forest National Park Authority. And before that, the much bigger project, the New Forest Remembers, the Heritage Lottery funded project uh, that ran for three, three years, James? Two years, thank you. <laughs> um, for which I undertook the desk-based assessment. These three projects then have given us the chance to look in more detail at documents such as war diaries, that were studied intensively by people like Richard Reeves uh, and myself. Plans at both a national and a local level that have helped us identify more. Aerial photography, uh, such as this particular photo of Ashley Walk up in the north of the New Forest. And field survey, uh, using this classic photograph. Uh, all field survey looks like this, neatly organized, neatly. <laughs> 
And so it has exposed some very useful documents that previously had not been widely recognized. In particular, we have the fort log for Stone Point Battery. This is actually the garrison's fort logbook, which is preserved in the National Archives in Kew, London. It tells us a fair bit about the battery. We now know that there were three six-inch Mark VII guns on naval mountings, Mark VIII. Um, there is a wealth of information that gives us a rough idea as to how the battery may have looked, something along the lines of this historic England illustration of an emergency coastal battery in the Second World War. Unfortunately, on the page where it says a plan of the fort can be seen on the inside front cover, that plan is missing. And so we do not have any idea what the battery actually looked like. What we do have, though, is a series of very accurate Cassini grid references. You can see 12-figure Cassini grid references, and when I finally managed to convert those into national grid, we were able to pinpoint the exact location of a few key features of the battery. So we know that the three guns in red were over just to the east of the car park. The battery observation post and the range finder were just here, just east of where the new visitor center is being built. Unfortunately, though, that is all that could be obtained from those grid references. And it tells us that this large piece of concrete on the cliff edge just here is the largest exposed bit of the, of the gun battery that is still visible. As you can see, that is eroding quite badly out of the cliff top. As you heard earlier, Leap Cliff Face is eroding at a very rapid rate. And it does mean that other features, uh, which were not recorded in the logbook and for, for which we have no coordinates, only come about through exposure such as this. This photograph taken in 2014 shows what is most likely a gun pit. We have cement concrete bags that have obviously been made wet and then turned into a hard fortification with a very thin concrete base. That was taken then three years ago, and that photograph was taken last week. So you can see how rapidly coastal change is destroying this site. In, the one, in one way, it's doing archaeology for us by exposing these features. That's a lovely section. Uh, but then uh, what it giveth, it taketh away. And we are now are very close to losing that site. And now is the time to make a record of it because it is not recorded in the logbook. The embarkation hard uh, further around the beach um, we have managed to learn a fair bit more about that, looking at documents that were first assessed by Colin Dobson in his report from uh, the 20th Century Fortifications Project. These embarkation hards then were used to load troops onto landing craft in advance of D-Day. We've now been able to find out that they weren't specifically built for D-Day. Of course, they were built with D-Day in mind, but they were actually constructed in 1942. We've been able to find some plans that detail the actual extent of the site and the way in which vehicles were designed to access the site and then reverse onto landing craft. The idea being, of course, that then they can drive out forwards when they hit an enemy beach. Those plans, rather than being details of the actual embarkation hards themselves, have actually only survived because they detailed the infrastructure that was built up to support them. And that includes the concrete access road that goes from Stone Farm down to the embarkation hard. These are actually the records that we are using to find more information. They have survived because they were distributed to other units and other companies. The main source of data, unfortunately, appears to have been destroyed at the end of the war. The chocolate blocks that form the beach hardening in the intertidal zone, courtesy of some records in Portsmouth Record Office, part of the D-Day Museum's collection, We've been able to find details of the actual construction of them. And that these particular chocolate blocks, the final version they settled on, were actually Mark 2B. And now we can get a rough idea as to how they were built uh, and how they were supposed to be joined to each other and to the concrete hardening platform of the embarkation hard itself. The Mulberry construction site, these giant slipways, uh, we've been able to find a little bit more about um, and how this site was designed to operate. And as I said, Carenza Lewis had to turn to Airfix magazine. We've been lucky enough to find a copy of a 1946 paper that dealt with the side launching of Mulberry Harbour pieces, which give us some idea of the actual methodology that was used, uh, the fixtures and fittings that would have existed on top of the extant concrete structures, the carriageways that ran on ball bearings to allow the Mulberry Harbour pieces to be slid further down towards the sea and then launch 
uh, at a perfectly horizontal plane. As shown in this picture, you can see that actually they're designed to slip down the, uh, the carriageways at a perfectly vertical horizontal angle, however you want to describe it, so that they didn't uh, basically crash into the seabed past the ramps. And so we can look at the construction of this site, this Mulberry construction site, with a new eye and finally understand exactly how it's designed to work. What we haven't been able to find is any details of the construction of this construction site. Those records possibly exist in a civilian outfit's archive somewhere, but they have not yet come to light. Although we can now perhaps understand what some of these features, this apparently random concrete block is doing there, is actually probably supporting a pulley for a winch that was towing the Mulberry Harbour pieces closer to the launching ramp. We've been able to put some more meat on the bones to a certain extent as well, courtesy of war diaries that Richard Reeves investigated. We know that the caissons, the Phoenix Mulberry Harbour caissons that were built at Stone Point were numbers 111 to 116. In the future, perhaps we might be able to find out exactly where those caissons went and where they ended up on Mulberry Harbour, if they even did at all. We've been able to find out more about the units that embarked at Leap on their way to Normandy, something that wasn't previously known. Uh, for instance, the 4th and 7th Royal Dragoon Guards, a tank unit, uh, loaded onto their LCTs in the morning of the 3rd of June from the craft moored off Stanswood Bay. 81 Assault Squadron, Royal Engineers. Uh, where is it? Ah, yes, uh, commenced loading in their LCT Mark IV at Q2 hard, which is the designation of the one at Leap, uh, near Lymington. We've been able to follow some of them on their journey across the English Channel to Normandy. This is the report of Midshipman Channing, uh, Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve, uh, and in it he states that they left Southampton, hard Q2, Stairswood, which is probably a typo on the part of the transcriber rather than uh, him himself. Uh, beached craft at Le Hamel successfully. Le Hamel is just outside Aramanche. Uh, the following paragraph oops, tells the lie, though, uh, that it wasn't quite as simple as beaching successfully. Um, let's see. During this time, the craft came under heavy fire from a believed 88mm and the port engine went out of action. Shortly after, the starboard stopped owing to fuel lines being severed by shrapnel. By this time, the tide was rising and the craft was carried up the beach by a rather heavy sea. A dull explosion was heard and later found that the engine room had been holed on the port side forward uh, to the extent of a hole at three foot by two foot. This was not in any way an easy landing for them and a photograph taken the next day shows LCT 886 uh, completely incapacitated, hence the markings, all looters will be shot to stop anyone thinking that they can just go and ransack this vessel because it's out of action. In fact, 886 was scrapped on site, uh, and when I visited Aramanche earlier this year, I was able to find some metal remains in the immediate area that it beached, in fact, the exact area that I know it beached from other photographs I've been able to work out exactly where that spot is. So some of that metal work may even be the remains of this particular landing craft that set off from uh, Leap Country Park. We've also been able to put Leap in its wider context. We now know that these are perhaps the only two surviving dolphins from an embarkation hard uh, from the Second World War. Unfortunately though, you can see, uh, and if you'll pardon the pun, they are very much on their last legs. Uh, they're not designed to have been there for 70 years. The legwork is starting to erode and it's only a matter of time really before it collapses, which raises the question of what we should do about recording sites such as this before they are lost to nature. We've been able to find out more about Mulberry Harbour construction sites and in fact this method of beach and side loading, uh, sorry, side launching Mulberry Harbour caissons um, was only done in four sites at Leap, two at Stokes Bay in Gosport and one uh, on Hailing Island. And there's nothing left at Stokes Bay, but you can see the remains of some here at Hailing Island in this photograph taken in 1999. But it's worth noting that last year, the photographs quite clearly show that this spit is starting to cover up that site. So there's very little visible at Hailing Island compared to almost the complete set of infrastructure at, um, at Leap. 
One of the things though that has been incredibly frustrating during the research of LEAP is the complete lack of photographs. And in fact, all of the period photographs that I've just shown you are not from LEAP at all, they're from other sites around the south coast. The only uh, piece of infrastructure that we've managed to find period photographs for, I should say Richard managed to find photos for, was the Pluto pipeline. Here is a view looking across the Isle of Wight, and you can use Google Earth to match this up actually with the various hills in the background. This was definitely taken at Leap. And this photograph, looking back up the shore at the manifold for the pipeline just there, gives us our real only clue as to where this particular installation was, because you can just see over on the right a gently sloping hill going down as it heads further over to the left. And that corresponds pretty much with this hillside which is on the west side of Leith Country Park, on the west of the main road that comes down from Langley. Now we haven't been able to find, despite Richard's searching and my own searching and the volunteers that have helped us with these various projects, any further information about the Pluto installation at Leith. So really perhaps it was going to come down to some good old fashioned archaeology to have a good look in this site and see what we can find that may be left. There must have been a pump house in there, there may be a concrete base somewhere in there that we can find and help us put a more definitive point on a map. And archaeology is helping now because it is giving us the availability and the option to record these sites in more detail while they're still there. And this is allowing us to create digital maps of the extant features and also monitor the change in those sites. Already coastal changes exposing and then recovering various aspects of the structure. Um, and this gives us an opportunity to record what is happening to that site over the next couple of years. Archaeology perhaps could also give us an opportunity to record more personal details, such as these footprints in the concrete uh, on the top of the Mulberry Harbour construction site. So when this concrete was setting, somebody obviously decided to go for a quick stroll over it in late 1943 or early 1944. And perhaps we can use archaeology to identify a few more sites in the immediate area. We know from this road building record that passing places are to be provided where necessary at intervals of 200 yards along the entire route between Bewley Lodge, which is up in Langley, and the entrance to Leap House, which is down here. So the road that runs from Leap to Langley. And some of those passing places that were deliberately built are very obvious, as is the concrete that was used to lay them such as this one. Others are perhaps a little bit more of a suggestion. Is this slight extension to the road a deliberately marked pedestrian route? Or is it where the road is slightly wider and somewhere underneath this hedgerow is in fact a massive Second World War concrete that was specifically laid to allow troops and tanks to pass one another? So where have we come in our quest for knowledge about Leap? Well, I think we've advanced some way from the early days uh, back before 1990. Um, as well as knowing that there are World War II remains at Leap, we have a host of archaeological surveys and historical research reports. Making that knowledge available to the wider public is easier with modern technology. The use of the internet, it is possible to publish quite detailed reports where they're available. And already, the various projects that I've alluded to, as well as the current project, Our Past, Our Future, is helping to bring all of that information together and make it more accessible. And perhaps with the building of the new visitor centre at LEAP, there is an opportunity there for more exhibitions and more detail about what actually happened at LEAP, therefore making that information more easily available to a much wider public when they choose to visit this country park. Thank you very much.